we're here. Um, it was great to hear Bob and Chris and Carol. Carol, thank you especially for the shout out. Um, and, you know, reminiscences of, of Phoenix. Um, on to new things now, on to, on to Perseverance, uh, on to Mars 2020. And I do want to uh, put this title down at the last minute bringing Mark Watney home, because I just want to give a nod to Andy Weir, who, um, and, if, and if anyone here has not read or seen The Martian, I guess I would wonder why you're here. Um, Mark Watney was really understood that when you take people to Mars, you need infrastructure. He also made it really easy for me to explain what MOXIE is because it's in fact his oxygenator. Um, okay, let me move forward. <clears throat> I'm not really going to talk about op uh, orbital mechanics. It's just an excuse for me to make a personal observation. There is an optimal time to go from Earth to Mars. It occurs every 26 months. It's called a, a, a Hellman transfer orbit. And it's essentially, it's very similar to changing lanes on the highway. You don't go straight sideways. You merge with the next lane, uh, continuing to go more or less at the same speed, maybe accelerating a bit. And that's what you do when you go from Earth to Mars. You accelerate a bit, you change lanes. But the trick is to arrive at Mars at the same time that Mars arrives at Mars. And we get one shot to do that every 26 months. Uh, and NASA has done that for, boy, since, you know, since the 90s. Uh, they've, there's been something going to Mars every 26 months, like clockwork. So what's the personal observation? Well, when, if you go out in the, in the evening, today, tonight, this week, well, any time nearby, uh, near, near this time, we're in what's called opposition, which means that Mars and the sun are in opposite sides of the earth. You can see from this diagram that that's, that the opposition occurs when you're roughly halfway to Mars. Perseverance is roughly halfway to Mars. And I just like to go out in the evening and stare at it. I find it captivating and and somehow makes it real to me what we're doing, that we are sending, you know, sending the work of our hands, the instruments, our measuring devices to this planet that looks like you could reach out and touch it this time of the year. Um, when we launch, and uh, good to see a couple of Phoenix alumni here. I remember the Phoenix launch very well. It was, it was, you know, like it was yesterday. It was fortunately right at dawn. So when you leave Earth. Um, you know, you, Mars is still rising in the wee hours of the morning, so you see a low in the sky and a dawn launch as if the rocket is hitting right there. By the time we land on Mars, uh, Mars will be rising in the sky, um, it will already be risen when the sun set and we'll see it bright in the sky. So watch it, look at it, it's inspiring. Um, also, this illustrates when we take humans to Mars. And, and here I'm talking about, you know, the first couple of things Chris talked about, the first astronauts going to Mars, the first research base, McMurdo Station type research base on Mars. We will follow this same trajectory, <clears throat> most likely. We will most likely stay until the next Holman transfer orbit comes around, which is about 150 days later. Plans change. Anytime you look at NASA, they have a different idea, but that's most likely in my opinion. And, and then we'll come back on that same low energy route. Um, so the most common way to think about doing this is that you set up that infrastructure that Andy Weir showed us in, in The Martian. You set it up first on one 26 month cycle and then the next 26 month cycle, you send the crew more or less with a toothbrush you know, and everything, that, everything they need is present on the planet. So that's kind of the model. Um, so why MOXIE? Why an, oxy why, why an oxygenator? Why make oxygen when you can just bring it? Well, I do want to talk a little bit about that and motivate that. Um, you know, and I start with the premise that everything that burns chemical fuel breathes. We burn chemical fuel. We call it food, okay? And we burn it in a very, very sophisticated and complicated a chemical system that we need to breathe to make to burn that fuel. Um, 
you see lots of pictures around here, whether it's an airplane or a lawnmower or a fire, a campfire, all those things are breathing oxygen to burn the fuel. And the key thing that we probably don't realize on earth, unless you're in the space business, is that the oxygen involved in that reaction actually weighs several times the weight of the fuel. Fuel is the light stuff. We're blessed on earth to have lots of oxygen. We never think about it, but it's heavy, several times heavier than the weight of the fuel. And what's the biggest fuel burner on Mars? A lot of people think we're doing MOXIE to get as people are nothing compared to what a rocket needs to breathe. Okay, a rocket is a great big heavy breather. It is the heaviest breather around. Um, the ascent vehicle that will get the astronauts from the surface of Mars to say orbit so they can at least rendezvous with a return vehicle and come home. Not even to get them home, just to get them to orbit. That uses a tank of oxygen that is the single heaviest thing that we need to bring with us in this infrastructure. I mean, you know, a rover might weigh a ton or so. We need about 25 tons of oxygen. We also need fuel, seven tons of fuel. That's harder to do in situ. You know, oxygen you get right out of the air and it's much smaller. And the humans, you know, half a ton maybe over the whole mission. So we need that half ton, but if we had to bring that, that's no big deal. Bringing 25 tons, a big deal, multiple missions. So that's the motivation. And this is nothing new. This has been known for decades. Um, and what's new here, okay, is that on the Perseverance mission, when it was first laid out, NASA said, this is the time. We're going to Mars. We're sending people to Mars. We need to start preparing now and not just with little research grants. We need to really invest in it. And they put a lot of money into preparing for human exploration. That's a real investment. And I think politically, what a great sign that NASA is serious about this. So the biggest piece of that investment went into MOXIE, which I have the privilege to lead with a bunch of other people and a bunch of other companies uh, involved in a bunch of other institutions. Most of the, the building was, was of the instrument and design was uh, uh, centered at JPL with huge contributions from a company called Ceramitech that did the, the electrolysis system, Air Squared that did the, the air handling and compression system, and also, of course, a big team on the science end. I particularly want to call out Jeff Hoffman, who was, you know, I've known forever. He was my master's advisor back in the 70s and has, frankly, always been a hero of mine uh, and an astronaut several times on the shuttle. And it's just such a thrill to be able to work with him after all these years on a on a space mission. Um, so anyway, back to MOXIE, what will it do? It is a one to 200 scale model of the kind of ISRU, in situ resource utilization plant for a human mission that will breathe in the air, which is mostly CO2 on, on, on Mars, about 1% as thick as on Earth. And it will produce propellant grade, or if you will, breathing grade oxygen. Why so small? Well, the rover's small, and more importantly, the power plant on the rover is really, really small. And so MOXIE is about as big as it can be, um, that, you know, as big as it, as it can be to, to fit on this rover and use that power plant. So it will make six to 10 grams of oxygen an hour, which is kind of what a modest sized tree makes um, uh, of great purity. And I have in the right those of us from the part of the country I live in know the, the MOXIE soft drink is about the oldest soft drink to be to use CO2, um, ironically, uh, as to be carbonated. And that had other, that had other um, things that that did that are listed there in a very old advertisement. Okay, how does it work very briefly? Um, the first thing you have to do and <laughs> what we're learning is dominating the resources of this thing is you have to have air handling. You have to bring in the air. The air is very thin on Mars. You can't just sit and wait until it comes in and, and clears away. You actually need to suck it in, ideally compress it to you know, a fraction of, of an atmosphere. Uh, so we have what's called a stroll pump that does that. Uh, we then have to convert that CO2 to oxygen and, um, and it's the byproduct, which turns out to be CO. We have to be very careful about that. If we go all the way to carbon, 
carbon is messy and gums up the work. So you want us to pluck one oxygen atom off every CO2 molecule, leave CO, which is a nice volatile gas, and not pluck two off and give yourself a carbon problem. So this elect solid oxide electrolysis unit or the SOXI does that. It's a ceramic based system so that to work, you have to heat the ceramic to about 800 degrees C. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of packaging that goes on to be able to do that heating and insulation and keep the thing all together when you launch it and fly it. So the, the item in the low and, and even shorter in height, but it's surrounded in a large package of insulation, uh, springs to compress it, wiring, plumbing, etc. cetera. Um, the way it works, I won't go into, but essentially each layer has an electrolyte because it's an electrolysis system, an anode and a cathode. And the first thing that happens is the hot cathode with the nickel coating splits the CO2 into CO and an oxygen ion, CO plus O. The oxygen ion with, a, as you see, a two minus charge on it is pulled through the electrolyte uh, with a, um, uh, let me turn on the laser here, uh, uh, with a um, electric field, it comes out the other side as, and can recombine, finds a partner and makes oxygen and that's sucked out through a whole separate plenum uh, than where the CO2 comes in. So how do we know how to do this? Well, basically because it's a fuel cell, we're just running it in the opposite direction. So a fuel cell might take CO, carbon monoxide and oxygen, run them together, get out CO2 and electricity. We do the opposite. We put in CO2 and electricity, we get out CO and oxygen. But that's why there's an art here. Um, the pieces, the upper left is what this stack of cells look like. There's only so much oxygen per square centimeter that the chemistry allows you to make with one of these cells. So you stack up lots of them and you wire them electrically in series. So you put one voltage across the whole thing. One, we run one current through the whole thing and one voltage and you get oxygen. It's packaged as I described in this complicated setup with this different kinds of insulation, there's springs, there's compression, there's tubes. It's put together with a panel that has, that has uh, plumbing flow control devices, sensors, a number of other things. It's integrated with the scroll pump, which sits over here. As you can see in MOXIE, the pump and the electrolysis system are about the same size. Okay, so real life, what does it look like? Well, the item on the right, this is the, this is the real thing being assembled. Uh, the item on the right is that assembly for the electrolysis system. The item on the left is the scroll pump. And this is in an early stage of assembly. Um, it's then put together like so with lots and lots of, <laughs> like any instrument, they look simple on the bench and you package them up in a little spot with lots of wires and tubes and it looks like spaghetti when you're done. Um, then you put the covers on it like so and then you wrap it all up like so. I asked the project manager why they went to the trouble of coating the aluminum with gold because both have comp similar you know, thermal properties. And he looked at me with a straight face and said, well, Mike, if we made it out of solid gold, it would have weighed too much. Okay, so, so I learned not to question JPL's use of gold. Um, here it is being tested in a bell jar. And then most exciting, here it is being dropped into the rover, well not dropped, gracefully lowered into the rover, ready to be bolted in. The rover is upside down uh, in this picture down at the bottom. Uh, that was an exciting day and Perseverance, I think it was earlier mentioned, launched on the 31st of July and it will land on February 18th around noontime Eastern time in, I think it's Eastern time in 2021. Uh, so we're all waiting for that day. Okay, so once we get to Mars, what do we do? Well, we expect to be given an opportunity to run what we've called a MOXIE SOL about every two months. In other words, about 10 times in the primary mission. Why so few? Well, because MOXIE is a power hog, even with the, with the small power system. And when MOXIE runs, nobody else can run the whole day because we use up all the power that's allocated for the payload for that day. So there we share, you know, we have a lot of shipmates 
on this mission of seven instruments and we rove and we take samples. So MOXIE will get a chance now and then to run. When we run, we'll run for about two hours, much of which time is just heating up to 800 C and then we'll make oxygen for 45 minutes or so. Um, and so we plan to spend some time just characterizing and see if it works like it worked on Earth. You can't emulate everything in the laboratory. That's why you take it to Mars. Once you've done with that, we want to show that we can successfully operate in night and day and winter and summer and all kinds of different environments. Um, and then we'll get into a stage where we'll maybe push the envelope a little bit, play maybe see if we can get you know, optimized and improved uh, late in the mission. So um, now, why are we doing this? We're doing this, of course, so we can do a full-scale mission to fill up a tank of oxygen for our astronauts, our crew, you know, Mark Watney and his friends, to get back to Earth. And even with a McMurdo-type station, we'll constantly be going back and forth. So we're assuming when we say scaling up that we have about 12 months to make enough oxygen. That's because this is a 26 month difference, but of course the, you have to get to Mars and that takes seven months or so. You have maybe 12 months or so to make oxygen and that gives you a few months margin, several months margin in which you can tell Earth, yes, we were successful. And you wanna know that back on Earth before you launch the astronauts. So before that 26 months is up, so we plan for a year. Um, and that means if you do the math, you have to, we have to make two to three kilograms an hour of oxygen, and that will take about 25 or 30 kilowatts of power, which fortunately suits really well the power budget that has been estimated for a, a, a base on Mars. So before the people come, before you, and hopefully someone in this audience will be one of those people, before the people come to Mars, um, we use the power plant to make oxygen. After people come to Mars, we use the power plant you know, to keep the lights on. Um, so what is the system going to look like? Well, we can now project with what we've learned that it should fit well within the, in, in the envelope of something that's, you know, the size of a chest freezer, weighs less than a ton, um, again, 25 kilowatts maybe, and uh, we're learning to make it more efficient uh, over time. Um, Oxion Energy in particular, which is a company that, that was spawned from Ceramitech that built the stack, they have uh, awards and grants from NASA to work on building a stack that will produce a kilogram an hour. So two or three of these, you know, maybe four or five for redundancy, will be sufficient to fit in that, that chest, chest freezer um, to, to produce the oxygen. And as you can see, it's about four... Um, it's, you know, it's, it's about four inches on a side. There's already a prototype of this. Tests are going on. So great progress in producing the next generation um, stack. There's also a next generation compressor being built with improved technology to be more efficient. And MIT, we're looking a lot at the filtering because believe it or not, you know, Mars is a dusty place. The filters are a big part of the mass and volume of this projected system. If you're gonna run for a full year, uh, day and night, you know, as someone pointed out, 24 hours and 39 minutes a day and seven days a week. Uh, if we're going to run constantly, we have to deal with a lot of dust and the filter technology is important. And we're finding ways to make that much smaller and lighter um, using some, you know, physics and clever geometry design to sort of passively filter out the dust. But ultimately, air handling, the filters, the pump, you know, the plumbing is still the biggest component of the system, not the electrolysis. I just want to do a quick shout out, shout out to a number of sponsors, whether it's JPL or NASA and our various uh, uh, university partners. Uh, I mentioned Oxia, I certainly mentioned Ceramitech and AirSquared who built these key components. And I think I'm ready for questions. Um, and while, sorry, while we're doing questions, I will just let this run. This is an animation put together by JPL. So good to go, take questions. Um, and I thank you for your time and attention. What do you got? Okay, great. First uh, question is, um, what are the biggest challenges to scaling the system up the size required to support a human mission? Hmm. What are the biggest challenges required? Well, the interesting thing is if we had the power 
enough, but not the power. No, I don't mean the authority, I mean power, a power plant now on perseverance that could support a full scale system. It wouldn't have really been harder to build it, honestly. Um, and I didn't realize there was sound in this. Hopefully you can hear me over it. So we made it small because we had to. Now that said, what we're learning from the mission is how to build it um, you know, efficiently, small, reliably, how to operate it well, et cetera. So we're learning how to do it better. Okay, but, but the challenges to building a full-size system are not really different. I'm hoping you can hear me over this video, otherwise I'll stop it. Could you hear me over the video? Uh, only partially. Oh dear. Okay, well, the short answer I'll re re repeat in a sentence is that building a full-size system is no harder than building the system we built. Um, we built a small system because we had to, but that said, the reason we're doing this is it's, it's, our, it's how we learn how to build that system so it's robust and it's efficient and it's, it's reliable. Great. Uh, do you have an estimate? I know you said you were mentioning um, you were reducing the cost and how much that's happened and what is the overall cost to make Moxie right now? Right now, uh, every, you know, of course, we don't split out the different pieces of it. It's the whole shebang from design through operation of the mission. It's really a cost for a mission. It's been on the order of $50 million. So as I said at the beginning, it's a very significant investment by NASA. It's a substantial part of this mission. It's not just an afterthought. It's not a token. It's a serious, it's a serious engineering and technology investment. Do you have an estimated lifespan for how long a unit will last, especially with dust storms? Well, there's two ways to answer that question. We have a, um, a, a unusual situation with perseverance. And then, as I said, we get a, we get to a moxie saw, we turn it on, we turn it off, we turn it on, we turn it off. Every time you do that, you're heating the system up to 800 C, you're cooling it down. That's when you really apply stress on a system like this, whether it's a fuel cell or whether it's moxie. And each time you do that, you degrade it a little bit. So we know we can do it 50, 60, 70 times, um, you know, without the degradation killing it, we've, we've tested it. If we have a full scale system, we will turn it on hopefully once maybe occasionally take it down for maintenance of some kind, but basically turn it on once. So it should go much, much longer. Uh, we are still learning whether the components we have in Moxie are robust to run for 12 months straight. Um, we're still studying that, but there's no reason they shouldn't be. Uh, quick question here on, uh, sorry. Scrolling five through here. Minutes. Sorry, what's that, Nora? Five minutes. That. Um, aside from what you're using on the rover, what is the, the power that you're considering for a full scale ISRU model? Well, for the full scale model, again, we're, with our assumptions that we're talking about enough oxygen to lift a crew of, of four, uh, the, the estimate has been on the order of 25 to 30 kilowatts. Uh, that's consistent with what NASA has been thinking about with respect to, you know, kilopower of having sort of a 10 kilowatt reactor in the size of a, you know, trash can, um, you know, to have a few of those. And it's also totally consistent with what, say, the design reference architecture says the, the base will need. So, so the idea is first you use all that power to make oxygen and then the crew lands and you use that power to keep the crew alive and well and flourishing. Uh, I got a two part question here kind of on scale. Um, so assuming we were using this maybe in an underground environment, would that, would the air pressure change the efficiency of the process? Ah, oh yes. Um, in fact, we have another handicap for the, for the, for the Perseverance mission. I see someone calling it Percy, which I love. Uh, another handicap for Percy is that it's really the first mi surface mission I know of that NASA loosened the restrictions on where we could land in terms of elevation. 
and said to the science community, okay, you can land at high elevations now. And of course they said, yeah, let's do it. So we're landing at a, you know, sort of kilometers higher than previous missions have and the air is a lot thinner there. Uh, so MOXIE already has a handicap. The lower you go, the thicker in the atmosphere, the easier it gets. And the more oxygen we can make with the same electrolysis system. So underground, even better. The thicker the air, the better. And uh, assuming uh, some of these plans for future colonization, how does this scale when you start having more than four humans on the planet? So say you have hundreds or thousands potentially. Well, even if we have a research base, changes. The reason it changes, Carol spoke uh, to the amount of, of ice that really exists on Mars. And of course, you can go up to say, Phoenix latitudes, and it's just all ice. You know, you just excavate it, you can do it thermally, you can get lots and lots of water, and you can truck it back to where the base is, wherever it is. So once you have enough human presence that it's practical to mine water, now use the word mining, you know, intentionally, that, that water is a mineral on Mars, right? It, it, it's not something that falls from the sky. Once you have the resources to mine water, you now have another key ingredient in ISRU from which you can get both oxygen and hydrogen and that together with CO2 gives you feedstock to make methane as a fuel. You use the two together. You use MOXIE technology and, and, and water electrolysis technology and combine it with something like Sabatier technology and you could be making, you know, vodka uh, pretty soon with those resources. So again, I think the, the chemical strategy changes once we have a stable presence. Have you done any research on using this on different planets, um, like using it in, on Venus? Yes, or in fact, uh, Venus is one of the few places where I think there's an application for it, um, because of course it's rather specialized to the Mars atmosphere. Venus is on the other extreme. It's got, you know, you talk about uh, advantages of caves. I mean, Venus has 90 bars CO2. So what would you use MOXIE for there? Um, on the surface, there's a really key problem, not only of how to get energy, but if you did try to make a, a, a 450 degree tolerant rover, you need a way to store energy, okay? and and so you could use MOXIE reversibly as a fuel cell electrolysis system to take advantage of all that CO2, turn some of it into CO and oxygen, and then turn it back to CO2 as if it were a giant battery. And that turns out to be a really appealing application. Also possibly in the upper atmosphere of Venus, if you're thinking about missions you know, to go ballooning, where the pressures are kind of more reasonable, you could certainly use it to create oxygen in the upper atmosphere. Great. Uh, I think that's all, all we have time for. I'm going to turn it over uh, to Carol. Well, thank you all. This has been a lot of fun. And uh, uh, please write me or ask questions other ways if you have more.